Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident in-service review of soft tissue infections with a large focus on hand infections. This is a supplementary episode and not a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations that may help if you're studying for boards or in-service. I have here with me Dr. Morgan Martin, our podcast co-founder. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Sanam. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, Before we dive into the topic, let me just describe the breakdown of this episode. First, we're going to go over a quick facts and details of some specific infections, and then at the end of the episode, we will have a rapid fire round of terms and key phrases associated with certain pathogens. So feel free to try to answer those with us as we go through them to help you remember. I'm going to throw out the cliche basically that, as we all know, repetition is key. Now let's get started. Morgan, hit us with some quick facts. The most common pathogen associated with hand infections is Staph aureus. With regards to any infection, get cultures before starting antibiotics. When getting cultures, if ruling out septic arthritis, it is important to send synovial fluid analysis for crystals in addition to cell count. And this is to differentiate from gout and non-septic causes of arthritis. Sunam, what are some clues that place patients at risk for infection? And what are the key words we should look out for on the question stem? There's quite a bit, actually. Diabetes, IV drug use, alcohol abuse, immunocompromised states, And that encompasses a wide spectrum from HIV AIDS to malnutrition, transplant and renal failure patients, certain behaviors like nail biting, fighting, occupational exposure, fishermen, dentists, nail salon workers, dishwashers. Okay, how does the CDC define surgical site infection? That would be an incision site or operated organ space infection within 30 days after surgery or within one year if an implant was placed. Now, with regards to decolonization for surgery, think nasal mupirocin plus chlorhexidine body wash for five days. Let's focus on specific infections and skin conditions now. Let's compare Steven Johnson syndrome versus toxic epidermal necrolysis, or 10, versus toxic shock syndrome. Morgan, which one of these is associated with infection? That would only be toxic shock syndrome. So for this one, think of a patient who just had an implant or a tissue expander placed, and now this patient has systemic symptoms like fever and a rash or even erythema at the surgery site. The pathogen is a toxin-producing strain of staph aureus or strep pyogenes, and the culprit is the toxic shock syndrome 1 or TSST1 superantigen that causes widespread immune stimulation. Can I interrupt you with a side note immunology review? You said the superantigen triggers a dramatic immune reaction. It triggers the body to produce massive amounts of what exactly that causes fever? That would be IL-1. Now, Sanam, what are the skin conditions that shouldn't be confused with toxic shock syndrome, aka the infectious problem? That would be Steven Johnson syndrome and 10, or toxic epidermal necrolysis. They're both caused by a severe drug-induced immune reaction. So think a patient that gets a medication and then develops systemic symptoms like fever, mucosal inflammation, and a specific painful generalized vesicular bullous rash. The skin shows blisters, erosions, and skin separation. With both of them, the main findings are in that epidermis layer. So on histology, you're going to see very little dermal inflammation, and it's mostly you're going to have keratinocyte apoptosis and full thickness necrosis of the epidermis. So what separates the two diagnoses from each other? Steven Johnson syndrome is basically just a milder form of 10. It depends so then on the amount of total body surface area that the skin is affected. With Steven Johnson syndrome, it's less than 10% TBSA, and with 10, it's greater than 30%. And that 10 to 30% range is really a gray zone that we probably won't get tested on. And as expected, since Steven Johnson is the milder form, it has less mortality, about 1 to 5%, versus 10 that has 25 to 40%. Let's go back to focusing on specific infections, starting off with herpetic whitlow. So herpetic whitlow is associated with herpes simplex virus, and you see multiple vesicles on the finger. 
think dentist or dental hygienist and young children. So anyone in contact with a lot of saliva. So a zinc smear will show giant cells with intranuclear inclusions. Treatment is observation as it's self-limiting disease about one to three weeks to resolve. Can we give a cyclovir to shorten the course? Sure, you can give a cyclovir, but it has to be within two to three days of symptom onset. So if a patient comes two weeks after the fact, there's no point in giving them any medication. What about incising the vesicle? No, this actually causes viral encephalitis. Only scrape the vesicle for a zinc sphere. Otherwise, leave it alone. Ooh, good to know. That would have been bad. Now let's focus on pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis. As the name suggests, it's an infection of the flexor tendon sheath. And the one thing you should always think of when you think of FTS or this flexor tenosynovitis, it's the four cardinal signs. The four of them are number one, fusiform swelling of the digit. Number two, partially flexed posture of the digit. Number three, tenderness over the flexor tendon sheath. And four, pain on passive extension of fingers. It's worth mentioning that it's a heavily debated topic, the key cardinal sign that would have the highest likelihood of diagnosing this condition. And the literature is mixed on which one individually would be the best sign, but there is evidence showing that the more cardinal signs that are present, the higher the likelihood of FDS. And refer to our YouTube video for the list of references. So once you think of flexor tenosynovitis, it's a surgical emergency to incise and debride. There's two techniques depending on how bad the extent of the disease is, open versus closed. In the open technique, you make a long Bruner incision versus in the closed technique, make a small incision on the proximal portion of the finger around the A1 fully and also on the distal aspect of the finger and irrigate the entire sheath with an angiocath. Okay, moving on to the next topic, color button abscess. This is a web space infection of the fingers. Because of the location, patients complain of pain on adduction of the fingers. And you might see a picture with them showing a hand with fingers separating away from each other at the site from where the web space infection is. So worth mentioning, this is in contrast to flexor tenosynovitis where on physical exam, patients will have painful finger extension. But with the web space infection, flexion and extension is okay, but the adduction is painful. So Sanam, how do we treat this? You have to make a dorsal and ventral incision because think of the abscess looking like an hourglass sitting between the ventral and dorsal compartments of the hand. So to adequately drain it, you have to attack it from both sides. Great, let's talk about space of Perona, which comes up on the exam from time to time. This space is important when you see a question or a patient with flexor tenovitis, the small finger and the thumb. That means the infection has spread to the space of Perona because it's the only area where it would let an infection of the thumb and small finger be connected to each other. It's considered the upper extremity horseshoe abscess. We can't talk about infections and not bring up necrotizing soft tissue infections. Since everyone is mostly familiar with this topic and the questions are usually straightforward, we won't spend too much time discussing it. The main highlights are surgical debridement is what you should be thinking if you're thinking about this infection with regards to a patient or in the question stem. Think surgical debridement, single best factor in decreasing mortality. So there are two types of necrotizing soft tissue infection. So the first being monomicrobial, most common pathogen being strep pyogenes versus polymicrobial. So diabetics are more likely to get polymicrobial type and not all pathogens cause gas gangrene. However, Clostridium perfringens, aka alpha toxin, this is the monomicrobial type. This causes the gas pattern seen on imaging. So keep in mind for necrotizing soft tissue infection, this is a clinical diagnosis. And as Sanam said before, surgical debridement is always the answer. Great, thanks Morgan. Before we get out of the special topics, let's highlight the difference between two of the most commonly tested infections. Vibrio vulnificus and myobacteria marinum. Big picture, think Vibrio makes you really sick. Myobacterium, it's a localized granuloma skin condition. Let's break it down. Vibrio vulnificus, it's associated with marines and warm salt water. So think Florida. And you guys know I'm from Florida. 
and I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty vibrant. So even though I don't really want to be associated with this bacteria, but for the sake of y'all's test, think of me and Vibrio in Florida. Um, but getting back to this, it's a gram-negative bacillus. It can cause necrotizing infection, and more importantly, hemorrhagic bullae. These patients are really, really sick with systemic symptoms. So versus Mycobacterium marinum, also associated with watery environments like marine and aquarium, but with this, you see only localized granuloma and no systemic symptoms. So these are patients who show up to your office after noticing a lesion for a while, and it's not necessarily painful. And before we move on to our rapid fire round, we're going to finish out this section focusing on sweat glands, because for some reason, this is where they grouped it in the question stems. So we have two main types of sweat glands, apocrine glands and eccrine glands. Apocrine glands are located in hair-bearing areas of the body, like the groin and axilla, and secrete watery fluid that's rich in protein. The sweat is initially odorless, but if exposed to bacteria, can become malodorous. And trust me, I have to bring this up only because it was a question on the in-service. Hydradenitis is also related to the apocrine glands. It's a chronic disabling skin condition that results in abscesses, inflammatory nodules, and draining sinuses in areas where you expect the apocrine glands to be, right? Axilla, groin, perineum. It's more common in women and in smokers. The early treatment is just localized wound care, smoking sensation, can give them some oral antibiotics. But for definitive treatment, they're going to need excision and closure. But you have to educate these patients that the relapse rates are really high, even if you excise it. Ecrine glands, on the other hand, are located throughout the body and secrete primarily water and salt. Hyperhidrosis, so this is just excessive sweating primarily from overproduction of the ecrine glands. Okay, fantastic. Now, Morgan, are you ready for some challenges with the rapid fire round? Yeah, let's bring it on. I'm going to throw a buzzword or a phrase at you, and you tell me what organism should be triggered in your brain. Literally, what should you think of when you think of these things? Got it? Oh, yeah, let's go. Okay, what if I said human bite? And that can be an alter, you can see on the question stem, an altercation, a fight bite. Echinella. Cat bite. Pasturella. Rice body. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Leeches? Arabonus hydrophila. Now, personally, I think these bad boys should go extinct, but let's pretend you have a patient, and what should you know about prophylactic antibiotics that you have to start before you start leech therapy? Right, so fluoroquinolones or tetracycline or Bactrim. And what if it's a kid you just did a finger replant on and you can't give them any of the above antibiotics? Third generation, cephalosporin. Okay, okay, focus. Hemorrhagic bullae. Vibrio vulnificus. Acute perinechiae. Staph aureus. Chronic perinechiae. Fungi, or most commonly, candida albicans. Dishwasher or gray fluid. Necrotizing soft tissue infection. Gas gangrene. Clostridium perfringens. Let's say a gardener is working with rose thorns. They see a granulomatous lesion. Sporothrichosis. And a felon or a tender finger pulp. Staph aureus. Okay, everyone. Thanks for listening to our quick and non-comprehensive review of the soft tissue infection. Now you are in the loop. Have a great day.